Welcome back. Fabulous Tuesday. Who here is worried about homework one? Who's not worried about homework one? Okay, I'll talk about homework one is number three. So, uh, so are there any outstanding not homework one questions from anybody on the stuff that I said in the last lecture or before? Okay. Logistics stuff. Homework one is still due on Thursday. I'm not going to delay it. I've got some panicked emails. That's okay. If everybody's panicked, and everybody does the same. Bad grade for everybody. That's why we have curves. Okay. Um, YouTube stuff is still screwed up. Sorry about that. The audio is still is going up uh, every day because I control that. YouTube is not controlled by me. So the bureaucracy at UC Berkeley, who is being very helpful. You guys, thank you. So um, office hours for me. The normal office hours today after class, 12.30 to 1.30, and then on Thursday it's delayed. Obviously it's too late as far as homework is concerned for you guys, uh, but it's, uh, sorry, it's not delayed, it's changed. It's uh, also, also after class, 12.30 to 1.30, okay? So, let's get to homework one. Um, first of all, what's going to happen is, is that you guys are going to hand in your homeworks, the GSIs are going to grade the homeworks. I will explain answers during the lecture so that you guys can see. Uh, I, I think we'll talk basically about the most common mistakes, right? And then I'll try and explain those so that you guys have an idea. Uh, obviously, the homeworks are the type of thing that we draw on to make the exam. So that'll help you in terms of the learning cycle. It's useful, and, I, and this is like a philosophical statement about homework. If you, make, if you make an effort, and then you make a mistake, and then you see your mistake, you will actually learn, okay? I am not a big fan of monkey see, monkey do kind of cookbook stuff because you'll do, oh, here's what he said, I'll just copy these letters across and then, oh, I got the answer, now I can go do something else. But you didn't learn anything, okay? So if you're struggling right now, uh, uh, here's my general advice. If you spend more than, uh, let's say, a half an hour on any one problem, like if you're crazy, some people will give up after five minutes. But if you spend half an hour, stop. Okay, you are definitely now wasting your time. You're going in an endless loop. Talk to your friends, talk to the people next to you, exchange notes, that's fine. If you guys learn from each other, that's fine. There's no problem with cheating. Don't photocopy somebody's homework, okay? That's not, it's dumb, because we'll catch you, and you don't learn anything. Because on the midterm, that won't happen. Um, I have an explicit instruction in the GSIs not to give you answers to the homework problems. I hope they're not doing that because they're helping you learn. Uh, I, I've been a, a GSI in the past. I know that's the first thing that happens. Can you just tell me the answer? No. Uh, it's, it's going to be something with a star attached to it. Right here. This is the answer. Okay. So, um, that's a bad joke. Sorry. Let's see. Okay, so here's some hints. This is where things get interesting, right? So... Uh, can you use a Lagrange <coughs> to solve a utility function that's equal to x plus y? Good. Because, as I mentioned in the last lecture, you've got these indifference curves, okay? And then you have a budget constraint. Now I need a small piece of chart. Well, you have a budget constraint. Okay? You're going, oh, that was unfortunately very parallel. You're going to get a corner solution very likely, okay, for perfect substitutes. So you can't use, the reason that we use Lagrangian is because we're going to use calculus. You can't use calculus with linear stuff, okay? That's essentially one of those things you figure out after a while. So um, those of you who might have been thinking that's a good idea, it's not a good idea. Um, it's just, that's actually just algebra fairly simple algebra, or it should make sense. If the price of Coke is more than the price of Pepsi and your utility from Coke and Pepsi is the same, then you go buy the Pepsi, because Pepsi is cheaper than Coke. Question number three, it says derive a demand function, right? That's going to be doing this. This is the demand function, okay? And I mean, what does this mean when you have this asterisk? What does that mean? in our P-star, Q-star world? Um, kind of. P-star, Q-star is, that's equilibrium, right? But what, in, in terms of economics and efficiency and utility maximization, what's the word that we use when we're doing, when we're doing calculus? 
We've got this utility function. Oh, and when I draw this dot in the parentheses, that means there's a whole bunch of garbage in there. So what that means is the utility from x, y is equal to blah, blah, blah. I just shorthand, I just put a dot in there. For people that didn't know that math notation, sorry. So if you have utility and it goes like, um, let's just say like this, because there is your, you're eating ice cream and you're going to throw up, what is this point here? It's the maximum. What's the notation we use at the maximum? Uh, U prime is equal to zero, or this is also called U star, right? This is optimal U, right? That's optimal. We're trying to optimize. So when you have uh, a star, you've essentially found the demand function for, uh, for demand under uh, optimization. And optimization essentially is calculus. The whole idea of calculus is where do we find the flat point, right? If we have, um, if we have uh, the indifference, cur indifference curves that are shaped uh, in, a, in a, what we call well-behaved or normal indifference curves, and we have our budget constraint, and then we find this point, right? What's going on here is that this is an optimal point. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be the, if we have the bundle x, y, this um, is going to be x star, y star, right? That's the optimal bundle according to the budget constraint and our indifference curves, right? So when I say on number three, it's like derive the demand function, you want to find the demand function under optimal conditions, which means taking derivatives. Okay, the Lagrangian. You set up Lagrangian, you take a derivative, and what you're doing is you're, fi you're finding um, where the, the marginal utility and uh, the marginal uh, cost are equal, right? Or the, the cost being the price, right? The price is not changing for the consumer. So that's hopefully helpful as a hint, right? But that's not what I'm saying, yeah. Do we need to take the natural log, or is it not? If, uh, if, you, if it's not easy to take the derivative, then it helps to make a transformation the utility function by using the natural law. So I showed you that as a technique, and I would suggest you do that with all kinds of Cobb Douglas constructs, right? So if your utility happens to be something like <coughs> x to the alpha, x1 to the alpha, x2 to the beta, you might want to take a natural law. You would need to take the natural log of the lambda part as well. No, 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 you're, you're, you're transforming the utility function. Oh. Okay? You're just, you're just working with that. Price, you're not taking natural logs of prices or anything like that, right? So this is, this might be confusing. Uh, so, say that I have $10, okay? And, um, uh, and then I go to the exchange office and I get, uh, let's see, go around. say that I have 10 euros, okay? And I go to the exchange office and I get $14, which happens to be the exchange rate, dollar to euro. That's just a transformation. I'm going from one currency to another, but I still have essentially the same amount of wealth. When you do a transformation with utility function, you say, hey, let's just do this, let's call that U1, let's call it U2. Let's just say this is an alpha, alpha natural log, X plus beta natural log, why? This is just a transformation. We're just writing it. It's, it's not equal. We're just transforming it into a different kind of units, okay, to make it easier to do the manipulation. If you have 10 euros and you're sitting in Germany and you come to America, you have to transform your money into dollars, you can spend the money, right? But you're just as wealthy having those dollars as you are in euros. We're just doing this transformation, okay? The properties of these utility functions are the same. The indifference curves are actually the same, or they look the same, okay? So the, the reason that, I, uh, that we use the natural law is just to make the math easier. And it's a transformation. It doesn't alter the preferences. It doesn't alter the relationship between x and y, because those betas are still intact. OK? Make sense? More or less? This is the iteration of learning. Um, so when you were given us that, it the alpha um, natural log would be plus y minus alpha natural log t. Or you know, alpha beta. Alpha natural log of b plus uh, plus one minus alpha natural C. Right. So that was for when you did um, with, you know, the FOZ and respect for the same as to alpha. Mm -hmm. So then to do it for beta, you just switch around with B as a C. Oh, no, the B, the B and the C was B are chips, right? Yeah. B is X well, and Y. Well, either way, so for the
Beta, beta, according to what you just said, beta is equal to 1 minus alpha. Right. In that equation. Yeah. With this, the homework, it's not 1 minus alpha, it's beta. Mm -hmm. Just do it. It's same, it's a, if you want to do monkey see, monkey do, you just do that, right? But you have to, but the, the beta, and in fact, the beta, I think, is defined as essentially 1 minus alpha. Is it, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it's said to be 1 minus alpha. Yeah. Don't go changing all the letters, okay? Because your homework's going to be a mess. You're going to be like, oh, I'm doing this from a lecture, except just do the homework. Right? Just stick with the beta. It's, 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 you don't have to write one line. Okay, number three, that was the hint. Number four, um, elasticity. Cross price elasticity. So, I, all I'm going to point out on this one is that elasticity and let's say elasticity at the alpha point is going to be the change in x1 star, that's the hint, change in price 1, price 1, x1 star. Okay? Just remember what elasticity is. It's when you do this and you get the answer and it's blindingly obvious, you're going to hit yourself if you spend more than five minutes on it. Okay? This is, unfortunately, the homework is getting you used to the jargon. And the jargon is what all of the other professors who are in all your other classes want you to know. So it's my job to torture you with all these things that make no sense. Right? Because you're like, oh, it's just a word. How come I'm spending two hours looking at a word? Well, because we're just trying to get you used to the concepts and working with the concepts. Okie dokie. And then the cross price elasticity will follow from, you can, once you work these things out, you'll see these things work. Okay? I hope. We'll find out. So, that's the homework. Any other questions on that? Just now? Alright. The walkout. I'm going to make it into a, a teach-in, which apparently is a popular word at Berkeley. <coughs> Yeah. The university doesn't care about the law. <coughs> well, they'll probably barricade sprawl or the university admin or something like that. Right? So this I want to talk about the walkout um, because it's a this is a concept of collective action, right? Collective action means what? Anybody with a pop definition? Right. And the, the big problem of, you, you plucked the yeah. tissue, right? The big problem with um, collective action is what's called defection, defectors. Right? Or, in the union word, scabs. You, have you guys heard that word scabs before? Okay. So, here's how it works. Classically, right? The union worker, what did I read this somewhere? Someone is getting exploited. Well, everybody's getting exploited. Some recent exploitation. So, you're working for the man, and you guys are all workers. This is a good example. You guys are all workers, and you're all getting paid, uh, someone was, ah, I can't remember. <coughs> you're all getting paid like $2 an hour, and you're all pissed off. And you work, well, you wish you could make more money. And so you say, we're going to go on strike. And so everybody in the room says, yeah, we want to make more money. We're going to go on strike. So, and I'm the man. Okay, so then you all say, okay, at 11.10 uh, in class, we're all going to stand outside. We're not going to learn, damn it. And because we're only making $2 an hour. Obviously, these, these uh, analogies are going to fall apart as I go from learning to union. And that's actually going to really be really important. So you all stand outside and say, we're not going to work unless you pay us $4 an hour. And I go outside and say, who wants to work for $3 an hour? Right? I'll take half of you, the first half of you. The other half, I'm going to fire. Permanently. Right? Now you've got a problem. Because some people might say, damn, three bucks an hour is more than two dollars an hour, and if I don't go and someone else goes, this is the dynamics, this is the game theory, then maybe if I don't go, then I don't have a job at all, and I could have gotten three dollars an hour. So you do this, and then someone starts to beat on you. Right? That's why a lot of violence around strikes is actually union workers hitting each other. Right? The scabs, or trying to hit the scabs, scabs is a term for the people that cross the picket line, right? They will bring them in from somewhere else and say, hey, you guys are all fired. We're just bringing in other people because they're unemployed and they want to make money, right? And this is the, this is the tradition 
in uh, organized labor is to try to prevent scabs from getting to the factory to keep the factory operating. Does that make sense? You guys heard this from like history of economics? So in economics, we just call this defectors, right? People that defect from the collective action because the benefit to them individually, personally, is greater than the cost to them individually. Although the cost to the group is going to be high, right? Because if there are no scabs and everybody holds back, then everybody theoretically can get paid four dollars an hour, right? So if you can enforce discipline so that people don't cross the line, then all of you will make more money. But that's the problem. The collective action problem is enforcing discipline. Okay? Collective action problem, climate change. It's like, oh, China, you stop emitting carbon. America, we're going to drive our SUVs. China's like, no, you stop first, right? So there's this problem of collective action. How do we get each other to slow down carbon emissions, right? And it's, so it's the same thing again. Now, as far as this walkout thing, I'm actually, I'm trying to figure it out. So I walk out and I stand out there and I don't teach. I get paid the same, so maybe I should do that, right? I just, and you guys, but you guys don't learn. Why would you walk out? And if I'm standing in here lecturing, it's even worse, because then you have to wait for the YouTube to never show up, or listen to this miserable audio, if you actually want to do well on the test. So, say that we both all agree, let's just go walk out, and we just take a day off. Well, did we make any difference to the university administration, like in, or the politicians in Sacramento? I personally know that there is no, they don't care. They don't, they, they, they don't care at all. The people in Oakland, they don't care. They will care if you block their parking place. That's much more important to them, parking place, right? But they don't care if you're not learning. So it's really weird to me why there should be a walkout from learning. It's like, let's stop learning and punish ourselves. I don't get it. So I'm not going to uh, walk out. Uh, and I'll be here on Thursday. That's the, the message, that's the bottom line. Sorry? Uh, comment. Yeah, comment. Um, as everyone's walking out, there's going to be events in Sprout all day. So it's not just party. Like day. Yeah, it's not, it's not like day Awesome. Off, but yeah. <laughs> let's not learn. Let's go have a party. And we'll pay tuition to have a party. Yeah, right. I'd rather spend 10 grand on beer than on tuition. So I'm not going to learn anything. So I just wanted to give you a reference. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm not done with this, but I'll keep going. Yeah. Yes, I am. So is that one of your bases? Yes, it is. The administrator is in Oakland, right? UCOP. Sacramento are the legislators, right? Who really don't, I mean, God, talk about dysfunctional. Like, the politicians are just, like, unbelievable to me. Um, so, as a reference point, I graduated from UCLA in 1991. My tuition is the equivalent of 3000 was the equivalent of $3,000 today, right? So your tuition is essentially triple that. And people are like, hey, damn it, we're paying more money. And who wants to pay more money? That's essentially the idea. Fees are going up, they're going to go over 10 grand next year, right? Who wants to pay more money? And I agree with you, who does, right? And, but then, as an economist, I have to ask the big question, right? Right? Which way does this equation go for you as students? Is it worthwhile to get a four-year degree, or a five-year degree, to get a degree? <laughs> right? Versus the tuition. Yeah. Yeah. Because I like to learn, maybe. Right? In the long run. Do you know, does anybody know what the net, pro I looked this up. Yeah. The whole point about the walkout and the free increase is not about us, necessarily, is also that is limiting, limiting access to, to incoming freshmen because this is going to cause less freshmen to come to Berkeley and also it's going to uh, increase the money. Decrease diversity, not necessarily. Increase the economic cost of an education, definitely, right? Price is going up, there's a demand curve, right? That's absolutely true. Now, does anybody know what the degree of subsidy is? To your education right now, 60 to 70 percent subsidized <coughs> by the taxpayers. Hopefully, oh, maybe not. If you're from out of state or out of country, there's still a subsidy, believe it or not. 
You pay 25 grand tuition if you're from out of state, I think. Does anybody know the number? 30. 30? You pay 30 grand. When I looked at it, it was 25. It was still a 20% subsidy from someone from another place who's not a Californian. He doesn't deserve it or whatever, right? But people that are in state, you're getting a crazy subsidy. Really nice. Go to Stanford, pay 35,000, 50,000, whatever the hell it is, right? Because Stanford and Berkeley, besides being equal in football, are equal academically. But that subsidy can't be necessarily viewed as a, I mean, the way it's viewed, I think, should be viewed is that it's, a, it's an investment in the future. Because what do you do if you don't subsidize education? You'll end up with a lot of uneducated people, and that's not good for economic growth. That's the that's a political justification for taxpayers subsidizing you guys, right? But this is my question. What's your marginal cost? What's your marginal cost is tuition, 10 grand even, right? Forget the cost of living, uh, apartments and rent and stuff like that. Your marginal cost of tuition is $10,000. And the question is, if I pay $50,000 over the course of my education at Berkeley, am I going to make more than $50,000 in two things? One is money, and the other is happiness. Right? Because I'm an educated person. Hopefully I learned something. Some people actually just rather skip it. They just want to pay 50 grand and go be a secretary making whatever it is, 50 grand a year. Okay? The net present value of an education in the United States, of a college degree in the United States, uh, is uh, $170,000. Does anybody know what the definition of net present value is? What? A little more accounting than you wanted. It's the sum, this is a, a summation sign, across all time of the change in income from year one, the change in income from year two, and so on until you retire. Change, the difference in income that you're going to get year by year by year by year, they are all discounted by discount factor. We're going to get to discounts later, that's a delta. Okay? They're all discounted, delta 1, the delta to the R power, right? It's discounted back to present value. The net is the difference. The present is adjusted for time, inflation, value of your education is positive, right? And that's the idea. Why do you get an education? Because I'll make more money, and maybe because I'll be happier. Hopefully both. So you're saying the extra money we would get from getting an education, if we put it in terms of dollars today, would be $170,000? Your lifetime career earnings would be higher by $170,000 difference. So it's essentially... In it, dollars today. That's right, okay. right. So basically, if I said today, you're on a path, you get to choose between going this way, and remember, this has nothing to do with social... Uh, Welfare. There's actually an additional benefit on top of the 170. It's about another 100,000 social welfare that goes to the everybody else in society because you're smarter than you would have been, right? Well, that justifies the subsidy. That justifies the subsidy, but that's what I'm. But the subsidy goes to you as an individual. There's this fork in the road. If you go this way, you get 170,000 dollars more. That's called an education or uh, a bachelor's degree. If you go this way, you essentially get zero dollars more. You're a, a high school graduate. Yeah, I'm not questioning the number, but um, doesn't the 170,000 seem really low? It seems really low to me. I mean, that's OECD number across the entire United States. Okay, so I mean, there's actually really useful studies like Harvard degree is worth nothing more than a Berkeley degree, but it costs a lot more, right? So then, in that sense, you guys are super smart because you're actually paying ten grand <laughs> to get a fifty thousand dollar education. Yeah. And that 170, does that take into account? Uh, Essentially, would you, would you consider wages lost for four to five years of earning that degree? Yes, it does. It does? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Net present value. Right. Um, no, no, no. Foregone earnings included. So, um, are you saying that you don't have a problem with the in, like, fee increases to like, the UC schools? Right. So for two that? reasons. I don't have a problem. So, here's the thing. We all want something for free or cheap, right? I talked to this guy, super free market guy. I'm like, what is up with subsidies? And this guy, Bruce Yandel, he's, a, he's this really genius political economy guy. And he said, you know, I really hate subsidies unless they go to me. Right? So essentially, you know, you all can quit right now. Save that $10,000. You can go work at, at the coffee shop for 10 bucks an hour and get an extra five years of, of profits at $10 an hour. 
and then the rest of your life. Right? But as, a, as we hope as a rational individual, you are choosing to be here because the value to you is greater than the cost to you in time and money. Right? Now, I completely agree that you all want it to be for less money, but the problem is that the entire financial system in this state is broken. Right? So they're trying to pass more of the cost of your education to you instead of the general funds. Well, it's just like with taxes, you know, you have high tax, you have high service, you have low tax, you have low service. And okay. I think what we're upset about yeah. is this is high tuition, low service. It's not that it's high tuition, high service, and we're all fat and happy and we're giving all the programs we want. I don't know. I look out there and I see this horrible ghetto campus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that library sucks. Wasn't Man, they have three like books. Thirty percent of the classes cut this year. I don't know. I got one class. That's library all time was also couldn't have. What? During, during final, the library's not gonna be open. So and they're closed anymore. Saturdays. Yeah, they're Saturdays. Saturdays. Yeah. How many people didn't get this class that you? I don't know. I want them all at the end here. That's like, that's like, you know, but the, here's the thing. It's like, demand is unlimited. Here's the, if it costs, the, the, the lower price goes, then we'll hire the demand, right? Let's lower the tuition to $2,000. Then you'll have like, <coughs> people trying to get in this class. Wait, now am I, wait, do I, what do I want here? Well, the demand's going to be lower if we're getting, if we're not getting what we want for the money we're paying. I mean, demand is going to get lower. You're mixing up concepts here. What is demand function? Okay, uh, question. New, hold, new, new hand, new hand. And I'm going to stop this teacher in, in a few minutes. Yeah. Wait, um, so can you explain why it would or this, Sorry, this is editorial. Can you explain why it wouldn't affect diversity or financial aid? Is it financial aid? There is going to affect diversity from the perspective that economic um, buying power and diversity are related, and they are, right? I'm a, I hate racial crap, right? But I'm a big believer in financial aid to poor people. No matter what fucking color, disability, whatever, right? I, I, that, this, so the diversity thing, I agree with, but I would target economically challenged people, not, uh, yeah, not skin challenged people, right? That's ridiculous. Next. A lot of arguments for why people should have this walkout is really because they say that the UC has like, like some billions of dollars in reserve that they're not using, and instead they're just cutting classes and raising tuition. But they're hoping to like raise an alarm to the UC regions. To stop doing that. It's to not, spend the reserve. Yeah. So I, the reserve is there presumably for some reason. The UC bureaucracy is crazy, right? Bureaucracies everywhere suck up money and spend it on bullshit, right? There's, it's, it's, you know, you look at these numbers. They look, at, they look at headcount. You look at headcount. I'm going to call it FTEs, full-time equipment employees. And you look at time. And you look at like lecturers or teachers or whatever, teach. And then you look at admins, and it's like this. Right? A bunch of paper pushers. So that to me is a waste of money, the paper pusher thing. There's actually really interesting uh, economic papers about the, the struggle between administrators, students, and professors. And professors, teachers, right? So I'm happy, yeah, let's cut all those secretaries. I don't know what the hell they're doing for me, except for when the lights go off. Right? Another question, yeah. Well, it's a comment. The, the walkout, as, as I understand it, in the meetings that I've gone to, is supposed to be the beginning of what previous comment tried to stress upon was that the beginning of a discussion with right. the UC administrators instead of just saying this is how it's going to go, right. say, well, why don't you cut here? Why don't you take this money out? Why don't you do this? And I'm not like, a big fan of temper tantrums as a way of discussing things. I, I don't. I don't think it will be a temper tantrum. But well, that's walkout is a what? The the walkout. I don't. Cons I don't. I personally you consider that a constructive dialogue. Well, <laughs> with the, with the with the teach ins Wednesday and Thursday night, yeah. I, I do. Teach ins. Well. Yeah. Okay. So that's fine. But, but honestly, then, it's it's. I mean, it, I I was thinking this walkout. You know, the analogy is. Um, the Rodney King, was the Rodney King, is that his name? Trial, and then he was convicted, or no, the, the, the policemen who beat him up, they were acquitted, and then there were riots in L.A., and they, and, and this is a very typical pattern. Let's have a riot, let's burn down our houses, or the, the merchants, right, who buy stuff from, and that, that never made sense to me, because, like, you burn down the assets of your own neighborhood. It doesn't, if you want to go riot, go to Sacramento, and, and you know, Annoy the legislature. Go to Oakland. Don't do it on Sproul. I know it's convenient for the commuters or whatever, for people who want bicycles, but go to Oakland and pick it there. They'll, they'll be much more upset about losing their parking places or their lunch time break. Right? That'll get their attention, and then you can start dialoguing. Right? Last question, last comment. Eeny, meeny, miny,
You want to bid? A dollar? Two dollars? <laughs> Go ahead. I have a more questions. So yeah. Go ahead. Go. On the homework? Yeah. No, oh, hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> homework? Our students like this designed to be a, a show of force to essentially assert yes. yourself as an equal bargaining partner? I don't know. I mean... I just mean because... It's you, supposed you, to be a force of numbers and there's many people shouting outside my window, make them go away. Right, because then, I mean, if you don't have equal bargaining power, you're not going to... You guys don't have equal bargaining power. But I'm saying that's it's a bureaucracy. It's an, it's an attempt to, to, sh to make a show of force. To you know how to, to do that? Go to Stanford. <laughs> right? So what do you propose? What do I propose? I, um, I, I would propose... Uh, <laughs> Like sending emails to administrators and annoying them so with I your concerns. But ask, ask, see, it's a weird, it's, it's, there's no traction. We don't want to pay money, it's not a negotiating position. I, I don't think that's the best position. And well, I honestly, we use your reserves is also not a negotiating I, I, I agree, and I, I understand that in the recession we're all going to have to pay a little more, but right. I think if they can make the increase go from 30% to 25%, that'll, that'll help us. That's the same argument, kids. I don't pay money. Okay, shutting down, shutting down. Teach it over. Okay? That was my opinion. We'll get back to collective action later in the semester, and then you'll have lots of new tools to use to get your fees lower. There was a homework question. Can you use a Lagrangian to solve Beyonce yet? No. No. There's your answer. Okay, so let's go to production. Why can't you use a Lagrangian to solve Leontia? Because they're perfect substitutes. That's a circular answer. Why can't you use it? There's no function to optimize, to differentiate. That's a great answer. There's no tangent lines in a minimum maximum situation. Right? Just as a graphic representation of that. This is tangent, this is tangent, that's tangent, right? Tangent, there's, a mil there's infinite tangencies to a point. Lagrangians are about points. Okay. Production. Now, on the, on the last uh, lecture, I wrote this. Uh, this is just as an example of production technology. The uh, torture you with this notation again. So Q of dot, right, equals a function of L and K equals, for example, um, labor and capital, L to the alpha, K to the beta. Okay? Yeah. I have a question about these exponents. So do these exponents in numbers always have to add up to 1? No. So they no. can't be bigger than This is I'm going to get to on number uh, 8. But here's your, your cheat sheet. Make an equal sign, equal sign. Okay. Here's your cheat sheet. Alpha plus beta equals one. This constant returns to scale. Alpha plus beta greater than one is increasing returns to scale. Alpha plus beta less than one is decreasing returns to scale. Okay. Let's. What's the intro? What? What is this? Remember this thing that we had, and this is what I'm talking about right now, so this is a good question. Um, for the sake of convenience, let's just say that this is Q of L. Let's only use L as labor, okay? Production is a function of labor. As I add labor, what is going, what's the line going to look like? What, look, what's the line going to look like? Think calculus thoughts. What's the line going to look like if we have constant returns to scale? Straight line, it's, it's a linear thing, right? That's constant. I'm actually going to bring 8, and we're doing 8 right now on that thing there. Okay? So this is constant returns to scale. What's it going to be like if it's decreasing returns to scale? Draw it in the air. Do your air drawings. Do our air drawings? Not exactly. That's marginal. Like that, right? This is decreasing returns to scale. You were doing the uh, falling. That's the marginal return. Okay? This is going to be Q prime. Decreasing returns to scale is like this. 
constant returns to scale. Now let me ask you, what's increasing returns to scale going to look like? It'll be going up, right? Awesome. IRS, the only time we like those letters. <laughs> I sent them money this morning. <laughs> I got my rebate from George Bush. I'm like, that's my Iraqi rebate. All right. So these are. This is essentially. This is just the description of the technology. Okay. You got your laborers. You just. You. You have your. You know. Think of it now. Think of the idea. The example of. Uh, you know. The the coffee shop. Right. You've got one coffee machine. You've got your machine. And it's got three slots. And you've got your one barista. Right, and you know, at one barista, you could be on. This is going to be constant returns to scale, right? They've got one uh, presser for making a coffee and one person, right? If you add a second spigot, you might go to increasing returns to scale, right? Because now the guy can work two of them at the same time, right? And maybe there's a third one. But say that you have another barista, so now you're back to constant returns to scale. And then you have another barista. Oh, God. And then you have a fourth person, because you're doing the Full Employment Act, for green jobs. And you've got five people, you've got six people. And after a while, you get to Soviet proportions. You've got ten people and three spigots. Right? And one guy's packing the coffee and hands the next guy. And the next guy's looking at the coffee, hands the next guy. And the next guy puts it on. And the next guy goes over here and pushes the button. Right? That's decreasing returns to scale. For every additional worker you add, you're not adding very much productivity. Okay? That's really what we mean. So, so does every constant return to scale in, um, eventually become a decreasing return to scale? If you just make it this is a big question, right? So um, what pattern typically happens? as we just do labor, and we're going to do output, right? So, um, the idea is that you're going to have um, increasing returns, then constant returns, then decreasing returns, right? That's a typical pattern, right? Now, this is a, uh, an interesting thing to look at. And this is, I'm oh, sorry, this is, um, that's not, see, this is, this is, a, all this is saying here is that you're actually producing less stuff with more people, which is kind of crazy, right? You should just fire those people, because you're actually producing less, right? Now, on the margin, it makes more sense. The marginal contribution is falling. But you can actually have a negative effect on output by adding more and more labor. They actually are tripping over each other. Right? Your laborers. Just imagine some kind of Keystone Cops kind of comedy, right? Or you, you add a whole bunch of um, new trainees to the coffee shop and the productivity falls negative, right? Because no one knows what the hell is going on. They put the, the mocha in the cappuccino and they have to throw away a drink. I mean, think it, just think fairly commonsensical ideas. If I throw more people at this problem, am I going to get more output? <coughs> more output but not falling, or am I going to get falling output? This is this is called uh, very unprofitable stuff, right? This will happen potentially though when you have, you don't have a profit signal, right? You, you have this let's employ everybody signal. Um, so look at the, at the um, quantity here. I'm going to erase this thing here. And I, I want to draw uh, a connection here between output, right? and costs. If I have, um, I'm putting quantity here, and I'm putting total cost here. If I have decreasing returns to scale technology, what does total cost look like as I have more output? And what you need to do is you kind of have to think about flipping this, these axes around. See the cube? Is on the vertical and Q is going down to the horizontal. Right? What's going to look like? You said something. Increasing, right? At, a, at an increasing rate, right? So this is uh, decreasing returns to scale. 
more or less. Right? Sorry, that says you have more what? As you have more output, your costs are rising at a rising rate. Right? So that's total cost. And the and, and you can just you can just draw the analogous increasing returns to scale and the very useful constant returns to scale. Okay? So this is the total costs that are incurred by the firm. Does that make sense on a fairly intuitive basis? I mean, think of labor costs being constant. You're paying every person you're paying ten bucks an hour or whatever. Okay? You could just change the L to a K for capital. That's fine. If you do it for capital and labor, it it doesn't. If you have both of them, we're having we're doing three dimensions, and you get this three dimensional shape. It's kind of going like three dimensions. Increasing returns to scale. So instead of having you know just this, you're having this whole three dimensional shape that is the interaction between capital and labor, and it depends on the substitution between those two factors. Just keep in mind that there are there, you can have substitutes or complements. There's trade-offs going on, but you're still having that general shape. Okay, does that make sense? And and anybody who's running the firm, the entrepreneur who's running the firm, who could be. Um, you can think of the, the entrepreneur as the capital in a way, right? Your entrepreneur is strained and stressed and after a while running around. It's like Bill Gates could not run Microsoft unless he started delegating and delegating and delegating authority. And the lower the quality of the authority, the, the less efficiency from each uh, manager is going to happen. That's why big organizations stop growing at some point, right? Sometimes they explode because they have no idea what they're doing. Okay? So, if you had capital and labor, this would just be in three dimensions. I'm not even going to bother, right? But you do this typical, you put a K out there in the Z axis. But the, but the analogy should be very strong in your mind, just using one uh, input. Make sense? Any questions on that? This is just to get an idea between the relationship between production and costs. Now, if you're looking at total costs, quantity, Let's put two things on here, total revenue and total costs. And we're using decreasing returns to scale technology, which I'm going to assume a lot. I'll just assume this all the time. So I'll draw a cost curve. And total cost, another way of writing this is C as a function of Q. Okay? Yeah. Is this total revenue over total cost? No, no, no. That's, they're both on the axis. Right? They're, just, they're sharing the same axis. Now, what would total, what would total, if you're a price-taking firm, what would your total revenue for, uh, curve look like as your sales go up by Q? Increase by decreasing? No, if you're if you're a perfectly com competitive firm, you're a price-taking firm. Huh? Linear, yes. Linear, and the slope is what? One. Or P. That's not very linear, is it? Let's um, actually let's do this way. Okay, as I go one unit of Q, I go up by P. Rise of a run. Is that P? That's P. Because you're price taking, right? Every unit you sell, you get P. I sell one unit, I get P. I get sell two units, I get two P. Does that make sense? This is very it's very straightforward. The algebra for this, when I say very straightforward, I'm hoping it's very straightforward. It might be confusing. That all of this, this is all the jargon that I said you guys are going to hate, but you're going to need. And as you understand it, it'll help you, uh, and, and bring in your analogies from the real world, as you understand it, it'll help you understand how things fit together, if I do a good job. So the straight line is total revenue? Yes, it is. Right? So if I wanted to talk about the profit of the firm, it's going to be total revenue minus total cost. That's an equation you're going to see a lot. We're going to elaborate on it. We're going to... But we're, it's just basic, right? I get a million dollars of revenue. I got nine hundred thousand dollars of cost. My profit is hundred thousand, right? It's just a, it's just an accounting identity. In this case, profit <coughs> equals price times quantity minus C of Q. Okay. Now, guess what I'm going to try and do next? Optimization, right? What am I going to do? Take a derivative, right? Okay. Right? Take a, take a derivative with respect to what am I choosing as a firm? Do I choose price? Profit maximizing firm. Do I choose, uh, sorry, uh, profit price taking firm. Quantity, right? 
derivative of that is p minus c prime q, right? And what am I going to set it equal to? To maximize profits? Zero, right? So let's look at this equation here. Now, is A where I'm maximizing profits? Who thinks it's where A? Raise your hand. You can say A or not A. You have to all raise your hand. A. Not A. A. We're going to iterate until everybody raises their hand, Dana. A. Not A. That's how you learn. A. Raise your hands. Who's keeping their hand down? You. Did you raise your hand? Not A. You want A? Not A. Not A. Not A. Pretty good. It's not A. <laughs> right? Why? Who said not A? It's to break even. Right? Your total revenue at this point and your total costs at this point are equal. <coughs> that means you make zero profit. <coughs> now here's the tricky part. Where is profit maximization occurring? No, that's where profit is happening. Maximization. Maximization. Max, max. Huh? The difference is greatest. That's a very intuitive and very correct answer. Right? But more importantly, let's just call it the point where these lines are tangent to each other. Okay? And I'm going to draw that marginal revenue versus marginal cost. If I take a derivative of those two curves, now, marginal revenue is, for a price-taking firm, what is marginal revenue for each additional unit sold? I sell a unit, how much do I make? Price. If I sell another unit, what do I make? Another P, right? So my marginal revenue is actually equal to P. And no matter how much I sell, I always make P. Which is a straight flat. What's marginal cost look like for this firm? So you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering since um, supply in the long run is horizontal, then why not just elastic in the long run? Perfectly <coughs> elastic. Supply, when you say, so this question is, um, in the long run, supply is flat. Is that elastic or inelastic or perfectly elastic? Anyone? This is now we're in a marketplace. That's a supply curve. Is that perfectly elastic supply or inelastic supply? Elastic. elastic. Awesome. Okay? Inelastic supply is like that. Elastic means no matter. Let's look at the definition. Well, forget it. You, you, does that make does that answer your question? Yeah. No matter essentially the, the no matter what. No matter what happens to the price, remember the definition of elasticity, dq, dp, let's quantity supply, p over q, right? No matter what happens to the price, the quantity supply doesn't change, right? But it's, it's not zero, There's no, it's infinite because it's just a flat line. I guess that's how it would work out, okay? That was a little aside, but it was very helpful. That's a, a perfectly... Elastic supply curve is essentially uh, useful for examining the long run uh, cost of any good from, from an industry, right? So that's what that is. Back to the firm, what does the marginal cost curve look like when we have decreasing returns to scale? Here it's increasing at an increasing rate. What's the derivative of this? Positive. Yeah, I'm going to say it's. Con I'm not going to make this. This C of Q is. If we're just, it's helpful to have an example. So say that it's just Q squared, right? The derivative of Q squared is Q, which is essentially linear, right? And helpfully, it rises uh, at two for every one. So let's just call it that. Where's the point of profit maximization for this firm? Sorry. For the derivative of profit, is that P minus C prime times Q or C prime of Q? 
Uh, sorry, C prime Q. That's a good point. That was a mistake. Why is marginal cost linear there? What marginal cost is linear? It depends. I've just asked for it to be, uh, this is the cost function. Okay. So it's Q squared. Okay. And the derivative is linear, right? But the marginal cost, it's, we, I will make the assumption often the marginal cost is just linear. It's just increasing, right? So, because it's, it's uh, if you remember, the, when we draw most supply curves and the supply and demand, this is demand, but what's it also equal to? What was I telling you guys? Equal to what? A firm, a consumer, the demand for a good is based on what the consumer's what? Preferences go to, and this is, the demand curve is what? Is it utility or is it some kind of marginal utility, right? So it's roughly equal to, it's a transformation of marginal utility. The supply curve is based on what? Marginal cost, right? So when we draw roughly equal to marginal cost, it could be exactly equal to marginal cost, but that's the analogy. You want to think of marginal cost. So this is a, a, a flat supply curve, right? But when we draw the, the classical axis, supply and demand, that's essentially increasing marginal cost, right? And it works almost all the time in terms of looking out there in the world. At your, your, you, know, you go to the supermarket, you buy tomatoes, the marginal cost of tomatoes to you is the same. But if the, if the aggregate demand for tomatoes is, you know, it goes from 2,000 tons a day to 3,000 tons a day, you're, you're not using tons, right? But if aggregate demand goes up, then the cost of those tomatoes is going to go up. Right? The cost of supply. And after, after a while, you're doing hydroponic tomatoes in the, in the dorms, right? Okay. So, because they're more profitable than other crops. Any other questions about? So, that's that. What's profit maximization over here? Huh? The intersection, right? In economics, where things cross. This is Q star, right? You set it equal to zero because marginal revenue minus marginal cost equals zero, or the more familiar term is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Let's do this. So this total revenue, total cost figure here is identical to this, except that we're explaining different concepts. That's total, and this is marginal. Right? Total, take a derivative, you get the marginal. Make sense? Okay. Now, if the firm, the cost equation to a firm, the total cost is um, composed of marginal cost, but what else? What else also? If you're going to start a company, do you just, do you only have marginal cost? Fixed cost, brilliant, right? <coughs> So what I'm doing is I'm getting a little bit more into cost. Which supposedly is fixed, but we're kind of mixing up, we're mixing up all these things right here. Total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost, which is basically marginal cost. These are some accounting identities that we're using in economics. I'll get to the difference between accounting profits and economic profits in a second. Average cost is equal to what? You guys saw this? You saw this in the, your other econ class? Intro, right? Good. So that'll make this easier to pick up. So let's draw some pictures. So if I have uh, a fixed cost greater than zero, what is the shape of the average cost, the average fixed cost, right? What's the shape of that one as I add more quantity? 
It goes down. It starts off at infinity, and it goes down like that. Because essentially you're taking a fixed number, um, n is a number, and you're dividing it by a larger and larger number, right? As q goes to infinity, uh, average fixed cost
equals price, right? Average cost times Q equals P times Q. That's an identity. Total cost equals total revenue. Profit equals right. Who think? Who's, what's the second? What's your second guess? B, right? It's one of those tangent things. <coughs> The gap between average cost and, and average revenue, price, is maximized. <coughs> now, in terms of increasing returns to scale and decreasing returns to scale, at point A, is the firm experiencing increasing returns to scale or decreasing returns to scale? Increasing, falling costs, falling variable costs, right? Point C, increasing or decreasing? Decreasing, right? The inflection point, calculus, is here, right? Producing, what's the profit maximization point? Infinity. It's like forever, right? Because your costs never increase. Turn off. Yeah, let's turn it off. Ooh. Okay. Got a little graphic yep. part. We're good. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Question. Is that like a parabola? <clears throat> a parabola. Sure. Doesn't so, matter to me. Okay. <laughs> we're not doing parabolas here. That shape is a parabola. It's a Super Bowl, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't matter what shape it is. <laughs> so then you want to My accountant is a parabola. So then you want to be operating at point C, right? You want to be operating at point C, right? Wrong. 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 But you want to be operating How much profit are you making at point C? Wrong. You just gave away all your profits. But I remember like um, E1 was saying that... They were wrong. No. Okay. But he was saying that um, as long as your average, was it, average cost is below your... Price line, average and marginal are different. You have like profit Right, right, right. But average and marginal are different, right? This is average cost, not marginal cost. Oh, okay. Right? Let's let's draw what, what I think what you're talking about. <coughs> they look just like that. They look just I know, it's not okay. okay, so all these curves and they all look the same. So here's price. Here's marginal cost. Okay, or let's, let's, uh, can we do this for marginal cost? Um, yeah, we can do this for marginal cost, right? And if we have price here, and this is marginal cost, marginal cost is falling, marginal cost bottoms out, right? And marginal cost is increasing. Right? And and this is actually the profit maximizing point. Right? Because your marginal cost at this price, or your, the marginal cost of the unit at this price is equal to the price. Below this price, your marginal cost is less than the price. So you should produce one more. You should not produce above here, because your marginal cost is above your price. A more conventional way of looking at that is probably, I've probably drawn it somewhere. Um, well, demand, right, and supply. And this is your marginal cost curve. And this is not... This just this just takes into account this part. This is what we usually look at. This is the this is what these axes here. This axis here is what you usually look at, right? This part here we usually ignore. Why do we ignore that? Would any firm produce in this area? 
following Marshall Cup, you wouldn't, right? It makes sense to produ keep producing, keep producing, and you produce until your margin, because you could say, oh look, marginal cost is equal to price. I should produce at that point. That's like dumb, right? You can, you can, your costs are falling, you can make a profit on all these units all the way up to here, right? All right? So what does that point for tangent on tell you again? Um, this is the minimal marginal cost, and it tells you where you switch from uh, decre uh, decreasing returns to scale to decreasing returns to scale. Right? But you can, you, can, you can get to decreasing returns to scale, you're getting less and less efficient, but you're still making money. That's okay. Right? As long as your, your price is above your marginal cost. <laughs> Optimal marginal profit, right? But you want to go to marginal profit equals yeah. zero, right? Marginal, uh, marginal revenue minus marginal cost is zero, right? But that's, yeah, that's where you're being the most profitable, right? And so this is actually, if you think about it, this could end up being where you're like, um, you're like happiest or whatever, but if you want to, if you want to squeeze every last drop out of your production, you go all the way to the end. Not someone else at hand? Yeah. So you're saying that optimal is that? Most people produce it. Most people produce it. C. Here? No, C. C. No, but you're talking about this graph here, right? Yeah. And you're saying op what? Optimal is? Optimal is B, and um, where firms produce is C. Um, no, I will not say where firms produce is C. Okay. That's an economic break even, right? So, um, You should not produce beyond B. You're, we assume if you're a profit maximizing firm, right, you'll stop at B. Essentially, what you're doing, because this is average cost, and I'm getting confused with these curves, right? But what you're doing is as you go beyond B, your average cost for, across all units, that's the total cost of it, your average cost is increasing. Essentially, every unit you produce, you're losing money in all, all the units you've made, right? You should just stop right here at B. That's optimal. But the, but the question of where should I stop here as a firm? So that's where you want to keep straight. Am I looking at average or marginal? Right? Because average is the per for all the units. Marginal is for that last, last unit. That's why it's it's you stop where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, or where average uh, cost is minimized against price. It's the same spot. If you stop here, yeah. okay, so what happens here? Your revenue box, you stop here, then this, these are your costs, right? And, and, and the revenue is, the, uh, is that box plus this little bit here. This little bit here is your profit, okay? If you stop, now I'm going to screw up this whole thing, but if you stop here, that's your profit. It's a much bigger area. Yeah. So what, you're, what you just said before she asked that question is that the point B on this graph is the same as the point on the marginal cost B, this is B. which you had labeled C previously. But that's B. That's now B. We're so you're saying over. B is where profits maximize. The letter B is, is not an so important letter. I'm just throwing it on there. In, okay. in these two examples, B right. is how B you and B are the same. Where profit. <coughs> okay. B and B are the same. That's, that's important, right? So this one is talking about marginal cost. This one here is talking about average cost. So you could draw the marginal cost curve into that one, and it would cross where B is? If, yep, let's do it again. Like if we do them all in the same graph. Yep. Which I should have done. <laughs> but I did. So... Price. Marginal cost. I'm going to call this point B for some reason. Okay. Today is brought to you by the letter B. That's right. They paid sponsor B. Now, what I want is I want, and, um, okay, this is important. What do we call, what do we, when we say fixed costs, um, 
How does that affect the optimization decision of a firm? Does the firm decide how much quantity to produce based on fixed costs? Because why? So you increase the quantity, the fixed cost is always the same. Always the same, right? What's the economic word for, what are we talking about? Sunk cost. There's sunk, that money's gone, right? And if you think about it, I'll get back to the point in a second, but you've got profit equals total revenue minus fixed cost minus uh, C of Q, just to make this obvious. If I take a derivative of this, what happens to fixed cost? Goes away, right? There is no decision. There is no optimization decision when you do a change in quantity, right? So fixed costs are there. The only thing that matters in terms of fixed costs is what? In terms of the firm staying in business. Huh? What's the only thing that matters in terms of the firm staying, fixed cost and the firm staying in business? You've got to make more than the fixed cost, right? Your, your total profit has to be greater than... Total, profit includes fixed cost, but your, um, your variable, your revenue has to be greater than um, your fixed cost plus your variable cost. Okay, we know that. But your, your, your total profit from producing widgets has got to be greater than um, the fixed cost of setting up the firm, right? Because basically the idea in economics is if, if it costs a million dollars to set up a firm and you're going to sell um, 10 units and you're going to make uh, $10 a profit on those 10 units, because you sell it for two, let's, let, me, let me write this out. So fixed cost equals 100, uh, price is equal to 2, uh, variable cost is equal to 1, Q is equal to 10. Is that a good business to, to, to run, to enter into? No, right? You sell 10 units, make 20 minus 10, you have a $10 profit against a $100 cost. You just lost $90. Right? They said this thing about... Um, uh, the easiest... I don't know, I've heard this before. The easiest way to... Uh, make a million dollars in the winemaking business is to start with a billion dollars and then buy a winery, right? Because you will lose money like crazy. Or buy, a, I think George Bush's businesses tended to work like this before he became president. So, and I'm not slagging George Bush all the time, except when he deserves it. So, this is, this is why fixed costs matter, right? After this decision, once this decision is take into account, and that's difficult, because sometimes you go down the road and bang, you have this massive cost. But we assume that we know what this is going in, and if this is equal to 100, or more importantly, if it's equal to 1,000, like 100 is break even, right? 1,000 is huge profits, right? So that's the business we want to get into. But how do businesses, how would you even decide that, setting up a business that you put in a million dollars or whatever, but you don't know what the price is going to be? You're sitting there and you've got a million dollars and you're saying, I want to invest in a business and you look at, I want to open a McDonald's franchise. Okay? And and this is the kind of numbers that you will you should know as a franchisee. If you're an entrepreneur, you have no idea. Right? Because you're an entrepreneur, it's like I don't know how much time how much I'm gonna sell it at all. I don't know what Q is. If you're an entrepreneur, you don't know this or this or this. And you pretty much don't even know this, right? Because you're starting a new business. But if you're McDonald's, they're like, we'll tell you this and this and this and this. Or Starbucks. That's why there's like 6,000 Starbucks. Right? Because hopefully they're making a profit on every and then, Or they shut down. You know. So then, so then how does average cost fit into this graph here? With the that's, what I'm, okay, that's what I'm getting to. So, let's just do it this way. Right? Because we want this to be the same V. Just as a rough way of relating those two ideas, right? Because if you go out here, that's notorious C, and your marginal costs are so high, now the areas under the curves are useful. Also, just to extend the analogy, the area under the marginal cost curve at point C 
your integral, right, is equal to what? The area under the curve. <coughs> Not exactly. What are the axes? <coughs> At point C, am I making a profit or not? No, right? If I'm not making a profit, then total revenue is equal to what? Um, okay, that's true. <laughs> but what's, what is it going to be equal to in terms of one thing multiplied by another here? Total revenue at point C is equal to what? Total P times Q. QC, right, minus essentially the area under the marginal cost curve, right? What's the sign for an integral? Is it like this? Yeah. yeah. Marginal cost at point C. The area under this rectangle is my total revenue, and the integral is my total cost. The sum of all marginal costs is total costs, right? Or if you wanted to, you could say AC at, which is the equivalent, right? That's what, that's what we're pointing out here. AC at point C times QC. These two numbers are the same at point C. That's supposed to be an in, uh, integral. The area, on, I don't even, I'm not even using notation. Right. How Are we supposed to be like, take zero, this really zero important? C. <laughs> zero to QC. Zero to QC. Awesome. Yeah, but uh, the integral doesn't take any account for fixed costs. It does not. Plus. Forget the fixed Oh, we have it in here too, right? So. This is assuming fixed costs are different. No, this is. Um, So that actually that's a good question because the marginal cost curve, so the marginal cost curve um, is not going to be the total. The fixed cost will be part of that total. That's a very important point, and I'm wrong. That, that's right. No, the, there's no integral of fixed cost. It's a chunk, right? So the integral of the marginal cost curve from zero to QC is some number less than that total. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the variable cost of QC, right? No, 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 no. The, the, the number, uh, the average cost at point C is this value here, times Q. But the area above that is Hold on a second, hold on a second. We're going to close this thing down and then we'll let you out. What? Didn't you ask earlier what that area represents? Yeah, the area under the marginal cost curve is a total variable cost. Okay, so the area from where to where to Q or to Q line? To Q, the whole area oh, okay. under so the curve. Right now. Yeah. So, and are you integrating with respect to what? Integrating, I'm just taking the area under the curve. Yeah, but as a cost, Integrating with respect to Q? Okay. I guess, I don't know. Last question? Last question? Any other questions? Raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to take this one and let you go. go so the optimal point is when price equals the minimum point on the average cost curve? The price is not changing. The optimal point is where you're, the distance between your price and average cost is the greatest, or where marginal cost and marginal revenue are equal. So it would be when marginal cost equals the average, or the minimum point of the average cost curve. Okay, thank you. Office hours now, and as I answer your questions, I'll move over to my office.